سبحان الله وبحمده سبحان الله العظيم سبحان الله Hello and welcome to the UK's first eco mosque. I am very very privileged to be the garden designer of this garden in front of the mosque um, with my wonderful collaborators Adam Hunt and Lulu Urquhart, without whom I could not have done the beautiful planting. Now before we go into the Islamic garden, which is just before the portico of the mosque, I just want to mention this, what's called the community garden. I'm standing in the middle of it now. We have four planting beds. One of the most important aspects of this community garden, not only is it looked after by the community, but it acts as a buffer zone between this very noisy road and the more peaceful interior garden. In Sufism, it is said that water is a reflection of the light of divine knowledge. So if we are drawn towards water in a garden, it is for many different reasons, many different very profound reasons. In the Quran, it describes these four gardens as being divided by four rills of water. Now here, of course, as with many other gardens in the Islamic world, as well as in the UK, the fourfold gardens are divided by pathways. And we have this here. And this is not only to do with the maintenance of water, but also to do with the scarcity of water. I mean, a great exception to this, and a very famous fourfold garden divided by water, is of course the Court of Lions at the Alhambra. I have talked about the idea of enclosure and separation from the outside world. Uh, Jannat al Fadus, which means gardens of paradise. The idea of Jannah, Jannah also means hidden or secret. Now, as I'm standing here um, talking, more and more do I see the importance of this because this road is very noisy. Um, we have tried to separate it with the railings designed by my teacher and mentor, Professor Keith Pritchard, who designed the, all of the geometric patterns in the mosque. Um, but these railings bring me on to another important feature of an Islamic garden, and that is scent. Scent is hugely important, and we've chosen most of the planting, many, much of the planting, to be guided by scent, as well as uh, several other principles which we'll get on to. But these railings, we planted the native jasmine. There are many different types of jasmine. Um, but the one, obviously, that grows best here is jasmine of officinale, and and the marvellous gardener that they have now maintaining the garden, Helen Seal, she's been training the volunteers to wind the jasmine up the trellis. And so it gives a beautiful wall of scent in the summer as you enter. Talking about planting, I just want to add that, of course, we chose many bulbs for the spring and autumn display, mostly for spring, because, of course, number one is the tulip. Um, and I chose mostly lily flower tulips and mostly species tulips because we wanted it to have a slightly more, well, naturalistic look. We can't make it look wild here because of the setting, but we've got some beautiful, really bright, jewel-coloured um, bulbs, that come, uh, tulips which come out in the spring, and we have some taller lily flowered ones as well. Uh, we've also had some Narcissi, um, Iris, Iris Sibirica, and we've also got, there's an Iris specifically called Cambridge. We hope that when the traffic is slightly calmer, that the garden, the breeze and the noise of the water does give you some sense of calm before entering the mosque. I think it's, it's important to add really that historically gardens are not necessarily um, the, the, the place, the location for a mosque. And I mean we can, we can look back at something like the Great Mosque of Cordoba where there's an orange tree courtyard, beautiful orange tree courtyard. Um, and then the Soleimani Mosque in Istanbul has actually got a kind of garden around it as part of a complex. But generally speaking, 
um, let's think of the, the, the mosque, mosques in an urban situation and you actually go straight off the street and straight into this very quiet um, a sanctuary, it's a sanctuary, it's a haven. Contemporary gardens now seems to be more influenced by Islamic design. For example, the whole new King's Cross development where they've got some fantastic planting, particularly in the, Arthur Khan, in the new Arthur Khan Centre where there are, I think there are eight or nine small gardens which are actually integrated into the building itself. Um, um, his, historically, there's Sezincote in Gloucestershire, built by somebody in the 18th mostly the late 18th, early 19th century, influenced hugely by Mughal architecture and gardens. Um, in Leeds, again, that's in the 20th century, they have, not Leeds, I beg your pardon, Bradford, they have the Lister Gardens, which is a Mughal garden. Very interesting, and I went to give a lecture there last year, and it works very, very well. There's very little planting, it's water um, with rills and pools, so very geometric. It's just water and green, which, as we mentioned some time ago, two key, you know, the two key um, features of an Islamic garden. Um, and there are a couple on rooftops in Kensington. The Ismaili Centre has an Islamic garden with a fountain. The Andalusian Garden at the top of what used to be the Derry and Toms building. There are a few. Um, I've designed a couple, small ones. Hampstead and Holland Park. So not huge, but I would say it's growing. I, I think it's growing. I think people, again, particularly in these rather difficult times, they're realizing how nurturing a garden can be on this deeper level, you know, not just psychological and emotional, but also a spiritual level. And I think that's what an Islamic garden can offer us. The main thing, and you can sense it, is, is the love of the person who has made it and, who's, and, and, and the subsequent generations who carried on nurturing it. But also, let's remember in Islam, everything, you, art and architecture and the whole um, of civilization, really, the Islamic civilization, goes back to this central tenet of, of divine unity. And this is the central message of the Quran. And in a way, this is, um, in any good Islamic garden, you will have a sense of this. You will have a sense of that um, sort of deep spiritual input, if you like. And I think this is really what slightly differentiates it from other gardens, from uh, different, uh, different cultures, if you like. I think through planting, through garden design, through sitting in a garden, just through being in some form of nature, how can you, you can't really argue about the beauty of a tree. I mean, you might, you might argue on a sort of superficial level, like you know, you prefer a crab apple tree to a birch tree, but actually there is something about being in nature which dispels aggravation and dispels aggression. And I've been reading a book recently called The Well Gardened Mind by Sue Stewart Smith, and it's absolutely fascinating about how the work that she's in the research that she's done in with prisoners, how they come out of their prison and they're given the opportunity to plant together and people, uh, they, 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 feel, um, they feel safe enough to actually relax and, and talk about themselves, be more honest with themselves. There's a sort of calmness which comes and I, you know, what could be better really than, than that kind of um, breaking down of a barrier, if you like. I mean, it's literally a, not just a barrier between cultures, but it's also um, breaking down a barrier with yourself and with your, with your colleagues, with your friends, with your co-prisoners. There's so much work and research that's been done on the positive nature of, of gardening, gardens, visiting gardens, but it's better to actually work with the soil and we have many marvellous volunteers here who, um, you know, have come forward to help. My name is Abida Ashraf and I work here as a volunteer uh, since the mosque is open. Garden is my passion and I love, uh, this is a very special place to work. I have learned a lot 
because uh, Helen is a professional gardener and she's a wonderful teacher and I love to work with her and she has taught me so many things which I never experienced in my own garden. Like um, how to plant, how to look after the plant and how to do the weeding, how to look after the, uh, how to use the tools, um, how to plant the bulbs which we have done all through the years digging, weeding, everything we did, which, uh, which was uh, very nice to work with her. My name's Helen, Helen Seal. I'm a professional gardener and I look after the garden here. Yes. Oh, it's such an exciting project. The first new major building which wasn't part of the university for years and for such a great community as well. I've been gardening for the Cambridge Muslim College and knew uh, what great people were involved with that and I just was very excited to be asked and it's a beautiful place to work. Gardening for the mosque is always exciting because um, I come every Wednesday morning and I never quite know who's going to turn up. Quite often it's uh, Abida but sometimes others come too and when we've had big projects on like planting bulbs or mulching I offer sessions at the weekend and then lots of people come. And it's, you never quite know who's going to come. And we've had toddlers, we've had people with back problems who can't do very much, people who've never gardened before, people who are really keen and knowledgeable gardeners, and they all want to help when they can. Lockdown was pretty sad, really, because there were just no people here. And that's what it's all about, is having people coming in and out. Um, so we ju I just kept coming in and keeping it ticking over with as best I could. And then it was great when lockdown ended and people began to be able to use the garden again. And Abbott began to be come back volunteering. There's something, there's just something about the practical aspect of being with the earth. And there are, once you're working in the earth, things are released being very unscientific here but um, there is something about the smell of the earth, the smell of the plants, of even even non-scented plants, it's just the green but um, it calms people down, it enables a certain a certain stillness and um, just you know co collaboration and friendliness arises. I sometimes say to my family, who are not necessarily practicing any religion or faith at all, um, how you can't really argue about a sunset or a sunrise. It is beautiful. So it's really through not just beauty, though, it's through the actual action of working with the hands. And it brings the community together. We have the, the so-called community garden here. I mean, it's not so called with partly because it's actually open to the public all the time, but also originally it was looked after by the local community. Um, and now indeed it's still looked after by the local, local community, volunteers for the mosque, um, headed by this brilliant uh, gardener called Helen Seal, originally from the Cambridge Botanical Gardens. And I mean, she's just been a godsend at maintaining this garden. Anyway, through beauty, I think, we can break down barriers. Through beauty and through working with the soil, um, there's, there seems to be plenty of research showing that this is, it, it helps tremendously. An Islamic garden is founded upon spiritual principles, and because people need really more in the way of nurturing, at this time, at these rather difficult times that we're living through, then I'd say they were more relevant than ever. But I also, I want to emphasize that it's the universality of the principles of the Islamic garden. And I won't repeat them because I've said them, said them already. But I want to end up with one thing. In the Paradise Garden, in the descriptions in the Quran, there is only one word spoken. And what is that word? That word is peace, salam. So forget all our deprivation in this world. Um, inshallah, if and, if and when, God willing, we go to paradise, it is peaceful. And, then, and a garden really 
in this world. It should be both a reflection and a foretaste of this peaceful paradise garden. And what we want is peace within, don't we? Peace from our own thoughts. The monkey mind, as the Buddhists say. And I think if you're in a beautiful garden, which has been um, constructed according to spiritual principles, maybe there's more chance of that. We have, at least we can hear the water now, instead of the lorries and the aeroplanes. So, peace. <laughs>